When I was seven years old in grade two, the nun was talking about the missions. She used to give morning talks, and we would encourage her to do that because the longer she talked, the less lessons we had. But she was talking about the missions, and that struck me as being attractive, so I began saying at the age of seven that I would be a missionary. This is before I ever heard of the Society of Jesus and before I thought about the priesthood. And then later, when I was, when I graduated, when I, when I graduated from grade school, I won a scholarship to St. Peter's Prep in Jersey City. And there, I met the Jesuits for the first time. And uh, when I entered the society, to start with, I was, I was teaching first at the Ateneo de Naga in 1948 to 52, and then was shifted to the Ateneo de Manila, principally, I think, for dramatics, because I came up to do the play on Francis Xavier in 1952. And I was, I was working in, in all of the extracurricular activities. I had dra dramatics and the uh, glee club and debating and uh, was moderator of athletics. And we were winning championships in those days. Uh, and then in 1960, I was shifted to media. So that was the beginning of, of media as, a, as an apostolate in the Philippine province, and it didn't have a name yet. That JESCOM came later. It was invented by Benito Ortigliani in Japan years later, a JESCOMEA. It began with JESCOMEA. And then uh, with JESCOMEA came JESCOM Philippines. Because I was very, very deep in, in media, and because, see, we, uh, we got into TV right away. Uh, they, we, we were strong, strong on radio, but when TV came up, everybody who went into TV came from radio. So we were, I was probably the, the first dramatic producer on TV in the Philippines. We did Cyrano de Bergerac way back in about 1953, which was an amazing thing to do in the time, because we had to do it live, see, it could not be recorded. And so when Marcos declared martial law, he declared it against mass media. There was nobody else to declare it against. The only one thing happened, I mean, those who are old enough to remember 1972, September, only one thing happened. All the radio stations were closed down. All the TV channels were closed down. All the newspapers were closed down, except the ones that Marcos controlled. So the, the, that was how it was going, and nobody else was covering it. All the other radio stations, brother, they were, they were playing music. So when, when Radio Veritas, when the transmitters were smashed, I was working with Ermita, Ermita, who was an Ateneo boy, a very good Ateneo boy, General Ermita, and then Isleta, Isleta, and then uh, Colonel Ciron. I mean, he's now Colonel Ciron, but he was then Captain, Captain Ciron. And they had taken over Asinto's radio station when Asinto escaped. The government had taken it over, but it just happened that it was in the control of Johnny Ponce and Relay. So we took that, 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 station and all day we move the we move the the frequency closer and closer to 846 see it, it's fairly close it's 810 but we moved it from 810 to 846 so that when finally it came in as radio bandido they thought it was the same transmitters and then the the helicopters were looking for that they went back and they they went back and they they shelled radio veritas again because they thought that somehow they got the things going, you know, and they, they threw shells at it. Uh, but, but it wasn't there. It was the, and they never found uh, DZRJ because it's right on top of, of, of Malacanang, and, and they couldn't triangulate. They couldn't triangulate. At least that's what they say. I mean, well, but Ciron says, no, it was a miracle. It was a miracle. <laughs> he said, they should have found it. They should have found it, but they never did. If they had found it, boy, we would have been dead. Uh, but, but they didn't find it. They didn't. So... We, well, we were carrying the news, the, the Philippine Federation of Catholic Broadcasters, not only in the city, but all over the country. 
See, and that that gave us stability. I mean, all of those stations were, you know, they were they were keeping the people abreast of what was going on. All of the work that I've been trying to do is certainly what the Society of Jesus wants to do. See, if you start with media, our purpose is communication, really. In the schools, that's our purpose. In the retreats, that's our purpose. In the missions, that's our purpose. In social work, that's our purpose. So it seemed to me, I, 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 whenever I was directing a play, either on stage or on radio or on TV, I felt that, boy, this is an apostolate. It never dawned on me that it was not. It, it, because the, the, everybody else works for money and we don't. I mean, all of it, we all have, we, all, we know what we're trying to do. We're trying to deliver a message. We're trying to say something. We're trying to be a channel between God and man. The strongest educational force in our world is media. It is.